right. Okay, so um, let's see. Why don't we start with questions? Um, does anybody have a, a question? Not yet. <laughs> All right. There were an awful lot of questions after class last time. And um, as I say, it's, it's always more efficient to um, have the questions during class. And I see where. Um, so let me review where we were last time. Um, we were talking about Dirac um, representation of the large group, which was one half this was a direct sum of D one half zero and D zero one half, and so the, the matrices that represent rotations look like that, and the loose ones look like this. Okay. And um, we mentioned how the uh, remarkable um, the anti-commutator for gamma matrices, which is gamma A gamma B, plus gamma B gamma A, is 2 A to A B, where this A to thing is um, 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 in, uh, in the S-controlled case. And um, if we say that the generators of the Lorentz group are related to the we define them this way, and J, 0, J as simply KJ, then these ones can be represented as I over 4, the commutator of gamma A and gamma B. And, um, Moreover, and under rotations, we have J, A, B, gamma C is minus gamma A, A to B, C plus gamma B, A to A, C. This is, this is saying that basically the gamma matrices are a four vector under the Lorentz group. And, um, Moreover, as we said last time, we, uh, we get all the commutators. That is to say, these generators defined in terms of as commutators of gamma matrices satisfy the commutators, commutation relations of the generators of the Lorentz, of the Lorentz group, namely A to A C, J B C minus A to B C J. A to D minus A to A B J B C plus A to B B J B C. And as I said to you last time, the gamma matrices are not unique. You can write any, if S is any 4 by 4 invertible matrix, then uh, for any set of gamma matrices that Satisfy, and this is the only relation they need to satisfy. You can then get another set that satisfies them also. Um, the Peskin Schroeder case uh, choice is uh, 0, 1, 1, 0, and gamma is uh, 0, sigma, minus sigma, 0. Uh, Weinbergs differ by a factor of minus i, and um, that's because Weinberg wants to have a minus sign here because the A is the opposite of the opposite of the present here. Um, okay. We, any questions? This is a good day to ask questions. Because uh, I got really 
balled up on the, because of the different conventions between Peskin, Schroeder, and Weinberg. I had to rewrite a certain set of notes three times. Okay, well, um, the simplest Dirac field is effectively a Majorana field. I'm going to just write it as uh, C and zeta, where C will transform under one half zero and zeta under zero one half. So, for instance, when you say it's a Majorana field, I don't really know what that means. All right, this is, this is, the nomenclature is not standard and it's really confusing. Um, the, the, the clear way to talk about it is to, is to, is to think in terms of particles. If you just have one particle and it is its antiparticle, it's a spin one half object, then, uh, then you can make out of that spin one half with that spin one half object multiplying it by a two component spinner you can make a zeta, a, a C and multiply by different spinners a zeta. And the idea then is that we just have the field, it's the four component field that's representing one kind of particle that is its antiparticle. Then, if you take, if you have two particles of the same mass, you can add them together as psi p as psi one myron plus pi pi myron two one over root two, and that gives you a Dirac field. That then will be representing a particle and the and the antiparticle. So it's just like with the case of scalar fields. If you have two of the same mass, you can put together two real fields, make one complex field that generates a particle, uh, an annihilation operator for the particle, and the creation operator for the antiparticle. But I can't I can't think of say psi Majorana 1 as the electron and psi Majorana 2 as the positron? The correspondence isn't like that? No, the correspondence isn't like that. It's only when I add those two together in this particular way that I get the Dirac field that represents both? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's like with... Um, the annihilation operator for a charge for say a positively charged particle, one over square root of two, a one plus i two. Okay. Then the annihilation operator for the negatively charged one is one over root two, a one minus i two. Okay. okay. And then, um, and then you see that a minus dagger is one over root two a1 dagger plus i, a2 dagger. So the field that, I'm, I'm doing this for spin zero, but it's the, the difference between spin zero and spin one half is that you just, in other words, the field always looks like this. Some sort of an integral, dqp, and then your factors of two pi and the square root of two p zero depend upon whether it's Weinberg or, mm -hmm. As in Schroeder, they use a 2 pi cubed. Um, and then you're going to have annihilation operator of P and, and general spin. And then an IPX or a minus IPX. I never remember what the. So having spin is just going to add an extra label? Well, it's, it's more than that. It's that this has several uh, components here. And um, so I'll call them A, and this would be then use of A of P and S. U then will be, say, a um, 2J plus 1 dimensional 
vector where A can go from minus J to J, um, and then that depends upon S. And then what you'll have, if we're in the Majorana case, then it's just a dagger of PS, and I guess we call this uh, V A of P and S, and then e to the minus I P X. And now I just just not to screw your screw up your memories, in the P and S convention it's a minus here and a plus there. In the this so this is what a general field looks like, and then if you uh, if it, it, in the Majorana case, if you then say you take um, you say this is I where I is one and two, you then take psi a. Single Majorana field, for instance. The first component there is is a, a left-handed spinner field, and the second component is a right-handed one. So, am I right to think that a single Majorana field sort of represents like a neutrino and an anti-neutrino? Is that true? Well, now be careful. When you have anti, um, if you're saying that the particles, if you're trying to represent a neutrino and an anti-neutrino, then you've got a particle and an antiparticle. In that case, you're really talking about two Majorana fields. Okay. Unless you're saying that you have a neutrino and an antineutrino, and the antineutrino is the same as a neutrino. Okay. Um, so then my next question is, does a single Majorana field represent any physical particle? A single Majorana? Well, pi zero. Okay. But, um, uh, and, I mean, the photon, for example, you can think of think of it as a myron field. Um, I think we've stroked this kind of enough. Okay. For a moment. All right, so let's see. Where, where were we? 
All right. Well, I was just the next equation was to sign D1, 1 over root 2, sign my R on 1, sign my R on 2. I'm not repeating myself. And you can think of this as 1 over root 2, C1 plus I, C2, Zeta 1 plus I, Zeta 2. And you can then think of these as 1 over root 2. And I'm writing here Psi D and Zeta D, meaning that that, in fact, I don't want to square the two out in front. In other words, this thing is the complex. Left-handed vial spinner, the other one is the complex. Okay. Now, the action density, the kinetic part is Psi bar I gamma A D A minus M Psi. There's the refinement notation of slash. Anything slash is A A, well, it's A lower A gamma A, which, of course, in Heston-Schroeder notation is A dot gamma minus plus A zero minus Psi. I almost got it wrong when I was writing that. Psi bar is defined as Psi dagger gamma zero, and the gamma zero, as I said over there, is zero, one, one, zero. And so this thing then is C dagger Zeta dagger times zero, one, one, zero, and that gives you Zeta dagger C dagger. So that's what Psi bar looks like. And the kinetic part then, Psi bar I gamma A, whoops, gamma A D A, let me get the better piece of the chart. D A Psi is then I C dagger D zero I minus grad dot sigma C plus I Zeta dagger D zero I plus grad dot sigma Zeta. And so you can see this is the left-handed action, kinetic action density plus the right-handed action density, kinetic action density. The Dirac mass term is minus M Psi bar Psi, and this is minus M, as we saw here, Zeta dagger C dagger C Zeta, and so this is minus M Zeta dagger C plus C dagger Zeta. And this looks very different from the Lyrano mass terms that we had previously, but as I'll show you in a minute, you can write it in terms of them. If this Psi is a Dirac field, then this is minus M Psi bar D Psi D minus M, it's the same business here, Zeta dagger D just means complex. And so this is minus M over 2, and this is C1 dagger minus, I'm sorry, Zeta Zeta 2 dagger C1 plus I C2 plus 
sigma 2 alpha beta. And now, how does this transform? Well, this would be um, the way the left-handed one goes, which is e to the minus z dot sigma over 2 c. And this would be this matrix beta gamma c gamma of Lx. And it's all that adjointed, because we have an adjoint at the end. And so this is sigma 2 alpha beta. And now this on this, this is adjoint in the sense of maybe I should write it as star. Um, because it's e to the minus z star dot sigma over 2 beta gamma c gamma star of Lx. And so now in matrix notation, this is just sigma 2 e to the minus z star dot sigma over 2 c star of Lx. And now the, the well, there's a star on this where complex conjugate is uh, so it's a star on sigma. The, the sigma 2 flip sign because of the star, where sigma 1 and sigma 3 are real. On the other hand, sigma 1 and sigma 3 flip sign when you pull through a sigma 2. So this is equal to e to the plus z star dot sigma over 2, sigma 2 c star of Lx, which is e to the z star dot sigma over 2 zeta of Lx. So in other words, if c transforms this way, then zeta defined that way transforms the other one. That is to say, the right hand is And the somewhat tricky part here is that this thing is a complex two by two matrix, but we're just taking one element of it, so it's just a complex number. And we're complex conjugating that number. Um, and uh, so that's why that star has to go there. I left that out on the state. And uh, so it's true. Now, did. Here I've assumed that everybody knows that when you pull a sigma 1 or a sigma 2, a sigma 1 or a sigma 3 through a sigma 2, you get a minus sign on the sigma 1 and the sigma 2. In other words, that sigma 2 e to the sigma 1 is e to the minus sigma 1, sigma 2. Do you want me to derive that? Anybody want me to do it? It's worth a chocolate. <laughs> I have another question. So why why do you uh, down here you still take the adjoint and then you you just take the complex conjugate? So well, when you're taking the adjoint of only one component of a vector. Oh, it's oh, all right. It's, it's just one. beta. That's why right. I put in a beta. All right. Great question. What kind of you like best? Reese's peanut butter cup. Reese's. All right. Good one. Thank you. All right. Um, And it's also true that if zeta is right-handed, then uh, c equal to sigma 2 zeta star is left-handed. So in other words, sigma 2 and, and the 
and the complex conjugation in that sense works both ways. It takes you from left to right, and it takes you from right to left. And that means, then, that zeta dagger C can be written as, in other words, if zeta is equal to sigma 2 C, then zeta dagger that is Oh, I left out the star. So this thing is C transpose sigma 2 C. So zeta dagger C is really, in other words, if we identify things this way, then zeta dagger C is C transpose sigma 2 C. And so this thing that's inside a Dirac mass term, zeta dagger C, is actually a Majorana type mass term. So in other words, you can write, and you can also write this as zeta dagger sigma 2. Where do you want to say that? Sigma, yes. Sigma 2 zeta star. Which is kind of, this is, remember when I wrote down the Majorana mass term, I said plus the Hermitian conjugate? Well, when you take the Hermitian conjugate, you get something like that. That is to say, the Hermitian conjugate of this is C dagger sigma 2 and then C star. So this, to recapitulate, minus M times R D psi D, Dirac mass term, all together then, you can rewrite it as minus M over 2, C1 transpose minus I, C2 transpose, whoops, sigma 2, C1 plus I, C2, plus zeta 1 transpose minus I, zeta 2 transpose, sigma 2, zeta 1 plus I, zeta 2. Alright, so you can write them all as Majorana mass terms, or equivalently, you can express everything in terms of Cs or everything in terms of zetas. And in fact, when people do grand unification of the standard model, what they do is they take all of the zetas and write all of the zetas in terms of left-handed fields. So everything gets written in terms of left-handed fields. And that way you can take all the fields of the theory, make them one huge vector, all involving left-handed fields, and that's your psi for the theory. And then under Warren's transformation, they all go the same way as a left-handed field. And then you screw around with that. But then, of course, what you've got is you've got, for any given particle, you've got a C and a C star. And normally one writes these things in terms of the complex vial spinners, so that they're written in particle and antiparticle. So then psi annihilates the particle. Psi star annihilates the antiparticle. So then in your big field psi, you've got psi and psi stars. You're annihilating the particle and the antiparticle. And that means your basic field is annihilating quarks and the antiquarks. And that's what gets you into proton decay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Oh. The star doesn't change the, the handedness, right, by itself? Well, it's the sigma 2 and the star that change. Right. But like you said, you'll have a whole column of size and size stars. Yeah, 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 right. So they'll all be left-handed or right. all well, well, right-handed. Or... Right. You've taken all the right-handed fields of the theory mm -hmm. and expressed them in terms of Cs. Or, or you've, you've written the right-handed fields as... You've got to have the right-handed fields there. So they appear as sigma 2 times the left hand fields. But that thing still transforms like right hand fields, right? So sigma 2 psi star is a right hand field. So I guess I don't see how the whole vector will transform like a left hand field. Yeah, you're right. I, I, I misspoke, actually. Um, Well, let's say you, 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 you right, let me rephrase what I said. You take your original theory and all of the right-handed fields replace mm -hmm. in this way so that now you only have left-handed fields in their complex front and their complex front fields. Left-handed fields and starred left-handed fields and a lot of signatures. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, now, um, all right, so let's um, say something about the plunk array group and then something about Vigna rotations. And I think we'll be done this way. Um, the plunk array group, of course, is just the Lorentz transformations plus the translation in space now. Uh, the translations in space-time have these commutation relations that you know about, namely that momentum is conserved, so it commutes to Hamiltonian, that um, pi, pj vanishes because translations in one direction don't interfere with translations in the other direction. You can go from here to bumblebees by going down Lomas, and then sort of down Carlisle and around, or you can go the other way down Lomas, down University, and then way down Central, and then get to the same place. So, all right. The uh, Lorentz transformations, of course, are U in theta and lambda e to minus i, theta dot j minus i, lambda dot k, so those are boost matrices given. Um, the infinitesimal one is I plus theta dot R plus uh, lambda dot T when in terms of those matrices that we used earlier. The inverse of theta and lambda on the P U of theta and lambda is of course, e to the i theta dot j plus i lambda dot k p e to the minus i theta dot j minus i lambda dot k. And this is going to be 1 plus theta dot r plus lambda dot p. p. Here, p is a four vector. And uh, the a, a convenient way of writing these is to say that 1 plus i plus dot j plus i lambda dot k Hamiltonian 1 minus i plus dot j minus i lambda dot k is h plus lambda dot t. This is the statement that H go transforms as the time component of a four vector, and the other one is I beta dot J plus I lambda dot K. P the three vector minus I beta dot K minus I lambda dot K is P plus H lambda plus 
thing across heat. Remember, this was the way a four vector transforms under an infinitesimal Lorentz transformation. Is there a question? What, what did you call the group? What? what? What was this group called? You're, you're including the Lorentz group with the translation? Well, everything together is the Poincare group. Okay. All right, so for the infinitesimal Lorentz transformation, because E, because HP, not the computer company, the four vector, um, transforms as a four vector. Well, remember what the rules for four vector for? We had that nice expression that we used for I, plus or minus I, sigma. Well, this is how it goes. And from that, you can figure out uh, the rules, namely that Ji with H is zero. Well, that just says angular momentum is conserved. Ji, in other words, these rules imply what I'm writing down. Ji, Pj is I, epsilon, I, J, K, Pk. This just says that the three momentum transforms as a vector under rotations. And then there, are, then there are two that are non, that are subtle and not intuitive. Ki commutator H is minus I Pi and Ki commutator Pj is I delta Ij P, no, delta Ij H. So you derive these from that. Okay. In fact, that might be a nice homework. I, it's a, I assigned it as a problem in this book that I'm writing. But, uh. Okay, so that means that the computation relations for the one of the generators, JAB and PC, these are then the generators of the uh, Poincaré group. There are six of these because J is anti-symmetric. Four of these will give the ten generators. Now, I'm not going to write down the commutator of the J's with the J's because it's already written down in the middle of the board over there. The rest of them are I P A J P C equals minus eta A B P C plus eta A C P B and because P A P B is zero. So that's the end of the uh, that's the whole Lie algorithm for the quantum break group. And it really doesn't I mean it's the difference between it and the, um, it's what you expect, except for those two bottom equations down there, the boost with the Hamiltonian and the momentum. They're, they're not completely obvious. All right, any questions? Actually, don't you know you were short? Okay. All right, now I want to, if there's no question, let me um, go over something that uh, Weinberg makes a, Weinberg uh, considers central to his treatment. P and S don't think of it as particularly central, at least I didn't see them focusing on it. But um, I think it's worthwhile doing it. It turns out that in the P and S notation, the Weinberg uh, spiel about the bigger rotation is actually easier to follow. So, um, this reminds me of something that somebody said that Weinberg's mind is so symbolically oriented that when Microsoft went from DOS to Windows, Weinberg wanted to stay with DOS. Um, which 
had some advantage. At least you had a man. Windows. All right. So let let me. So this is the Weinberg stuff in the P and S notation. All right. Let's look at this equation. P zero is just m zero. I'm considering the massive case here, not the massive case. The whole of quarks and leptons apparently are massive. S is then a spin index, and this can be a particle of any spin. So you can think of m zero as the vector, the full vector of the particle at rest. P zero s means that the particle is at rest, and it has spin s in the z direction. This is spin in z direction. Spin up or down or spin one half would just be spin up and spin down. Spin zero index is irrelevant. Only has one vector zero. For spin one, it could be one zero minus one. That's what s is. What is u? U is a unitary operator that represents in Hilbert space a certain Lorentz transformation, and L of p is a standard Lorentz transformation that takes p zero to p. Now there are many Lorentz transformations that take you from p zero to p. In particular, you can stick any rotation in front of the p L of p, and it will still take you from p zero to p because p zero is invariant of the rotation. A reasonable choice for L of p. Actually, now that I think about it, the choice that I wrote down in the notes isn't quite the right choice. Let me say it a different way. Let me say what L of p will actually be. L of p is going to be R of p hat, B of p zero, and R inverse of p hat. So in other words, this thing doesn't do anything to p zero. B boosts p zero up to p, but in the z direction. So it won't be in the z there. And then R of p takes the p, momentum p in the z direction, and rotates it into the direction of actual p. But anyway, it doesn't matter what it is really. This is a convention that Weinberg's convention, but you just have to decide what your L of p is going to be. This gives you a somewhat better, things are more standard. So you put in the rotations only that you can always boost in the same direction, always in the z direction. Yeah, the boost is always in the z direction. And this just makes everything work out a little bit nicer. In fact, it's so unnecessary that I didn't do it in the notes. I left it out. I just remembered it. Okay, let me point out one thing to you. You see this S here? It's the same as that one. Okay? And this is a definition. Now, here's the key part. Let's consider an arbitrary transformation on this state P of S. Well, it's certainly U of lambda, U of L of P, P0 S. Okay, now we're going to do something counterintuitive. Does any of this depend on spin then, or what exactly is going on? We're doing this for arbitrary. This is Weinberg's approach. So as I said, you start from fundamental principles and do it with complete generality. It's just positive mass. That's the only restriction. 
Mahomet and Massa. I mean, in other words, if you're doing this, these transformations, does the spin affect the result if I have one half or three halves? We're doing all the spins at once. Okay. It doesn't add up. All right, just keep going. That's the way Weinberg does things. All the spins at once. Okay. Here's the trick. You stick in an L of lambda P, and then you take it out. Okay. Notice what this L of lambda P is. L is the standard thing that takes you from P0 now to lambda P. So let me write it here. L of lambda P on P0 is lambda P. Just as L of P on P0 is P. Fine. Now, we rewrite this as U of L of lambda P. And now this, of course, is since this U is an interdimensional unitary representation of the Lorentz group, the product rule works, and we get U of L inverse of lambda P, lambda L of P. All right. Everything's straightforward here. But now something magical happens. It turns out that this is a rotation. And the reason is that L inverse of lambda P, lambda L of P on P0, well, L of P on P0 is P, so this is L inverse of lambda P, lambda P. But L inverse, well, first of all, L of lambda P takes you from P0 to lambda P, so L inverse of lambda P takes you from lambda P to P0. So this is just P0. So we're back at rest. So this structure here, L inverse of lambda P, lambda L of P, takes P0 to P0. That is to say it takes a four-vector at rest to a four-vector at rest. That means it has to be a rotation. And so this is called W lambda P. It's an L inverse of lambda P, lambda L of P. And this is the rotation, and in particular it's called the bigger rotation. So this, I assume, was worked out by bigger in the 40s or so, maybe the 30s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Anyway, does somebody have a question? It was a bit confusing. Well, this is confusing. So the lambda is a boost. No, lambda is an arbitrary Lorentz transformation. All right, and the L of P is a boost on P. The L of P is the standard Lorentz transformation that takes you from P0 to P. It depends on P. All right. L of P on P0 is P. P0 is the particle of rest. What kind do you want? Anything. Give me an arm and joy would be a nice change. Oh, yeah. Sounds good. By the way, when you ask a question, you can tell me the flavor you want. Simplifies things. So what was the argument for calling this a rotation? Why do you call this a rotation? Because you're saying it takes... It's a rotation because it takes P0 to P0, and P0 is this. So if a four-vector M0 goes into M0, then it's got to be a rotation. If there were any boosts, then it would be moving. So what kind do you want? Why can't you just say it wasn't a rotation? Wait a second. I've got to reserve him first. What do you want? You don't care. Here's M&M. You've got M&M. Whoops. 
Why can't we just say it's P0 and forget about the rotation? Yeah, I'm confused as to how it actually does the rotation. I see that it's not a boost, but is it? The point is that this thing, well, if it's not a boost and it's a Lorentz transformation, then it's going to be a rotation. Can it be a density? Yes, of course. But can it be a rotation? It can be a rotation. The identity is a rotation. It's just a trivial rotation. Any particular flavor? Huh? I don't have any particular flavor. You don't care? The one that will hurt the most if it hits it. The one that will hurt the most. All right. Okay. So we're at the following stage then. You have lambda on P and S is U of the standard Lorentz transformation from P0 to lambda P times U of W of lambda P times P0S. So that's where we are at this point. On the other hand, we know how P0S transforms under a rotation, namely U of W on P0S is just a sum S prime to the minus J of J PJ of W S prime S P0S prime. In other words, when a rotation acts on a particle of rest with spin component S in the Z direction, it turns it into, it leaves it at rest because it's a rotation, but it can change the orientation of the spin. And the way it does so is a representation, in fact, a representation of the rotation group, of the rotation W in particular. And if the particle is of spin J, then this is the standard 2J plus one dimensional representation of the rotation group. I mean, this rotation is in real space, right? Yeah. So it's changing the orientation here, but the spin is like an internal degree of freedom. So are we just saying that, well, while we know what this rotation does to sort of the real vector that we have, it could also mix up the internal degrees of freedom? Because, I mean... Well, well, wait, wait a minute. Let's be careful. Spin is not an internal degree of freedom. Spin is the intrinsic angular momentum. And if you take something, for example, that's spin one pointing up, and you rotate it 180 degrees, then it's pointing down. Notice I chose spin one because I didn't want to get confused. In spin one half, I'd have to actually write down e to the minus i theta dot sigma over two and be sure what it is. That hits one zero and does whatever it wants to. So does... The second, does that u of L of lambda P, is that going to get rid of whatever we do to these P's, or these S's, I mean? Because we have a different S. This is changing our spin. Right, right, right. I just did the W part. Okay. So we're going to get back to the same spin. Right, right, right. So, u of lambda, then, on P and S is u of L of lambda P sum of, on S prime, Pj, S prime, S of W, P zero, S prime. Okay. That is 
and say from this equation, u of lambda p of s is u of this, u of w of p zero s, u w p zero s is that, so we have this. This unitary operator sails right through these numbers and hits this state. And so what we have is sum on s prime And now what is it? Well, it's just lambda p s prime. Because remember our definition is that p s is u of the standard Lorentz transformation that takes p zero to s, same spin. So that's what we have. So now we have our actual rule for Lorentz transformations. Lorentz transformation then a laboratory state of a particle of momentum p and spin component s. It's this rotation matrix times the transform momentum and these various spin indices. So that's the way it works. And now in the p and s notation, p s is in fact square root of 2 p zero, a dagger of p and s on the vacuum. And this is sum on s prime dj s prime s of w. And this one is square root of 2 lambda p zero. That is to say the energy of a particle with momentum lambda p. A dagger of lambda p s prime vacuum. And of course the inverse of lambda on the vacuum is just the vacuum. And well, I'm not really deriving this. But what's consistent with all of this is u of lambda, a dagger of p and s, the inverse of lambda is square root of lambda p zero divided by the p zero. So I bring the p zero from over there. Sum s prime equal to minus j to j dj s prime s of w of lambda and p. That rotation matrix times a dagger of lambda p s prime. So this is how the creation operators for a massive particle of spin j transform on the Lorentz transformation. There's this square root of the ratio of the energies. Then there's a rotation matrix. And then you have the creation operator for the particle that has momentum there. So that's the way it works. And this is then the generalization of Heston-Schroeder's equation T2.38, which was just for spin zero, namely u lambda a dagger of p. The inverse of lambda is just square root of lambda p zero over p zero a dagger of lambda p. So this is for the spin in this case. The generalization is that. So it's a very natural generalization. The square root is carried over. And then instead of, I mean, in other words, it's the simplest it possibly could be, except that the rotation is a little bit complicated. But it's just a rotation. All right. Well, it turns out, and I don't think we want to actually go through the details, but what Weinberg then does is says, well, if the creation operators behave this way, and of course, under trans, so this is how they behave under Lorentz transformation. Under translations, as we saw before, a dagger of p and s 
you inverse the wage is going to be EI, P.A, a bag of P&S. Even minus I, P.A is going to be EI, P.A, a bag of P&S. So this is the way they transform the translation. So now we have how creation operates. What's the annihilation operating? The adjoint. Creation annihilation operates then transform under the whole plumb ratio. And what Weinberg then does is say, well, you can define that field as an integral EQP. He uses a 2 pi to the 3 half, but in the testing server language it would be like this. And then what you have is you have then U, let me give this an A, UA of P and S, A of P and S, E to the minus I, and if we do it for the complex case, then it's the end of the creation operator, the antiparticle, P, S, E to the I, P dot X. So he says, if we make a field like this, we know how the field operators transform under Poincaré transformations, then we know how, I'm sorry, we know how the creation annihilation operators transform under Poincaré transformations, then we know how the field transforms under Poincaré transformations. And remember, for the spinless case, I worked it out for you, namely that if the annihilation creation operators transform this way under Lorentz transformations, we saw that the field transformed as U of L, phi of X, the inverse of L is phi of L X. Well, what you find out is that if the creation annihilation operators transform that way, then you can arrange the U of L psi A of X, U inverse of L is, now I'm not sure, I'm doing this from memory. It's like that with, well, I don't have the Weinberg here with me, so I don't know the Weinberg quote, Weinberg quote. It's either D A B or D B A, I don't remember which. I think it's probably this. Oh, you have it? Yeah, I've got several copies. Here, I can take a look at it. Well, I don't have fields before. Yeah, I got it right. Oh, wait, there's a little subtlety here. Yeah, no, I see here. Okay, so this is right. And if you do it with Poincaré transformation, then it's plus A. So what I'm looking at, yes, all right, there is one little twist that one can have here. This is S prime S. You can write that as D S S prime of W inverse and star. 
Right. You see, this is a, so going from there to there is effectively adjoining the matrix. And adjoining the matrix means that you go, that you invert the rotation. So that's another subtle thing. All right. Everything that's written down here is right. The U and V guys, we added those to deal with this fit, right? The U and the V. Right. Are they operators? No, 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 no. These are just numbers. This is a 2J plus 1 dimensional vector. Okay. And as you might imagine, if you apply the Lorentz transformation here, the P's and the X's are going to behave exactly the way they did in the scalar case. So you're going to automatically get the LX here. But you're going to get this D for the Wigner rotation multiplied into the two spinners. Okay. And so what you have to have is that these spinners have to be chosen in such a way that when they get hit with the D's, they behave correctly so as to give you this overall field transformation group. And that then gives you the criteria for what the U's and the V's are. And of course, Weinberg being Weinberg works that out from first principles of complete generality, arbitrary spin. Yes. The way you said it, it sounded like you had the answer to work backwards. How does he... But yeah, once you get... I mean, you want this, you've got that, and so you then work backwards to figure out what you want to be. How do I know I want that? Oh, this is lovely. This means that under a Lorentz transformation, the field transforms according to a particular representation of the Lorentz group, albeit with an L inverse. There's an L here. So that's exactly what you want. And this doesn't put any restrictions on my field that I'm worried about, I guess is my question. This is what the field must be to have this transformation. Yeah, because you see, yes. But notice where all this comes from. And this is a nice part of Weinberg's approach. Namely, that what he starts with is how particles must transform under Lorentz transformations and under space-time translations. This is the only rational way to do it. And with all that rational way, then you get these creation and annihilation operators, and they've just got to transform this one. And once they do, then to get the fields, you want the fields to do this, so then that tells you what the U and V have to be. And, oh, let me, let me, I want to show you one more, more thing. Well, you want to see it or not, we're, we're a minute behind, over. Takes just a second. Sure. All right. Here's the darkest four. All right, let me, this is maybe not that much of a talk. All right, here. The, okay, the Dirac equation is, of course, I D slash minus M psi equals zero. Okay. Now, suppose phi is just a four vector field that satisfies box plus M squared phi equals zero. So it's a field with four components, and each of the four components satisfy the Klein-Gordon equation. Then, psi of X defined as I D slash plus M phi of X is a solution of the Dirac equation. All right, I'll let you puzzle that out, since I don't want to keep you here longer. It's a cute exercise. In fact, let that be homework problem one. Okay. 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 Okay
could make sure that someone is there. Although I'm afraid you... Isn't PSI a program that uses PSI as its word? No, no. PSI is a fallback. Well, fallback. PSI is a way of holding an object. It's not a fallback. It's a fallback. Thank you.